45 minutes. Yeah. It's all about this. All right, let's make it happen. And it's recording. Uh, gentlemen, welcome. This is the third time for both of you, but this time it's a special one. I have two of the greatest minds in our arts today, Robert Drysdale and Dr. Roddy Ferguson. Today we are discussing the rise and evolution of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu by Robert Drysdale. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. I have a feeling I'm going to be a spectator uh, today. <laughs> I think you better leave that. I think you, I, I hope, did you read the book from cover to cover? I can't say yes. I, I, because I was traveling, I picked out some of the stuff that truly interested me and I have some questions and, um, uh, yeah. Leave, okay. leave, leave the questions, Chad. You leave with the questions, man. All right. So, uh, we all know that there was the project of the closed guard back in the past. But um, I'm not going to ask too many questions. I know these things are very hard to to materialize, but um, how did we get from like the closed guard or opening the closed guard to this? Um, well, um, well, the documentary is still happening. We had a legal issue. It's been solved. We're back into production. Thank the plan you. is at the end of the year. It's a four episodes a docuseries four short episodes and, and you know i think we decided to break it down in parts like that because you know we believe it's just going to be easier for the public to watch instead of sitting there for two hours two and a half hours straight mm. right um well the other thing is well, so that led to the book the first book opening close guard right and the, and then this one really the second one the rise and evolution was really i felt that i couldn't get everything the more i learned the story the more i understood it I felt that there were a lot of things that I couldn't get into closed guard documentary that didn't make it into the book. And the better I understood the role of Carlson and all of this, the more I felt like he deserved a place in, in, in the story that he never was granted. I think he, I mean, I'm not the first person to say this. I mean, if you're reading, if you read Shockey volumes two and three, if you read it between the lines carefully, it does, you know, a large part of it is about Carlson and, and because Shockey was written according to the records available, not because of political leanings, you know, I think Carlson's centrality is really a matter of like it was inevitable because he was the central figure in jiu-jitsu throughout its most, you can argue, its most important period or one of its, at least a period that shaped the kind of jiu-jitsu that the world went on to practice, right? The kind of what we call Brazilian jiu-jitsu today. So he's a very important guy. And I wanted to talk about him. I wanted to talk about the, the, the influence of Vali Tudo in jiu-jitsu. I finally got a hold of the 1975 rule set. And when I read that, I almost fell off my chair. It was like, wow, this explains so much. And I think a lot of people miss like, how much jiu-jitsu changed from 1975 onwards because of the new rule set. And I think if you had to pin it, we're pin a date. Like we have to choose a date where what you know what they were calling jiu-jitsu back then became a ground, a more ground-oriented version of judo. I think 1975 is the strongest candidate. I think there were moves towards that direction before that, but 1975 onwards is a, it's crystal clear they become like specialized on the ground because of the rule set. I didn't say this in the book. I kind of left it in between the lines for the reader to get, but mm -hmm. I kind of wish I had said it because it's speculation. You're not supposed to be speculating without mm -hmm. evidence. However, it's very tempting not to because it, the, the, the date 1975 is so instructive. Because if we start the, the partition from judo, if we initiate that process, let's say we put it early 1930s, which is when they started their moves away from judo. They started disagreeing in terms of the rule set. They disagree in terms of the hierarchy. They disagree in terms of the rule set. And they start making moves, moving away from judo. This is crystal clear, which is with Yasui Jono, the disagreements. Um, they're not really, their 1954 rule set is not a judo rule set, but it's not ground oriented either. It has a 50 50 balance, 67, same thing. So between 19, early 1930s and 1975, we're talking more or less 45 years where there is no leaning towards the ground. They have a more or less 50 50 ratio. 1975, that changes. Not only that, you see the influence of Valetudo in the rule set of MMA. Right, because the points are scored as you advance into positions where you could potentially do damage in a fight. Now, this is what I wanted to say, maybe I should have, but I strongly believe that that had something to do with Carlson. Because you got to remember, in 1975, Carlson is the leading force in Jiu Jitsu and Rio de Janeiro. Carlson and Hollis Gracie, right? And 
I don't think that's a coincidence that 45 years to have a ground oriented version of, of their jujitsu. And in 1975, you see this massive shift, right? They start scoring like four points for mount, four points for the back, where previously they had scored one. It was one and one. The ratio was even, round and standing. So that was a bit, I think that's one of the most interesting parts of, 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 of the, you know, of this, this new book. That's the, I mean, I, I think it's very relevant. Uh, we wanted to talk about the fall of the Carlson Gracie era, the end of the Carlson Gracie era due to popularization. Like Carlson was the guy, began the process of democratizing jujitsu and opened it up for the masses, right? He wanted to open it up beyond class, beyond race, beyond anything. I was like, do you want to train hard? Do you want to be a Spartan? Do you want to be a warrior? Get over here, I'll train. So that was his mindset. This kind of this seems to shock a lot of jiu-jitsu practitioners. But prior to Carl Grace, Carlson Gracie, there were no group classes in jiu-jitsu. They only did privates and self-defense. Self-defense or the privates, right? So the kind of the brand of jiu-jitsu that we're practicing is really something that was born of Carlson's gym. Because prior to him, it was self-defense and private lessons. There was no group classes. There was no randori, which is, yeah. there's no it's common sense in any sport. But believe it or not, like these guys didn't have a class where students actually spoke. Um, Carlson changes all that, right? So there's that too. But the process of democratization that he started by opening jujitsu up to everyone, not just people who could afford it uh, or could afford private lessons, he all initiated. It got so big that because Carlson was not a man with the mind to scale things, he was not a businessman, right? He he was the kind of guy that would train champions from white to black. He was outstanding at it. Remember. Carlson's team was the dominant team in Brazil for three decades. Right? It wasn't until the mid-90s when the affiliation system began to take shape that Carlson got left behind because he was a one-man army. The affiliation system was just too much for Carlson. So that process right there of opening up jiu-jitsu was what ultimately led to the end of his domination. It's, it's very ironic. And then I wanted to talk, too, about, I think this is very relevant, the birth of IBJJF. And I think they're very significant. I have my disagreements with them, but in general, I think whatever structure and order Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu has today, it's thanks to them. I think without them, is it's it would be very difficult for Jiu-Jitsu to have survived with structure, with order, with rank, with system, and they offer that. So they became the closest thing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu has ever had to the Kotokan or the equivalent. Um, you know, a lot of work to be done. I argue that they almost come into the scene a little too late. And some of the divisions that that we see today, I think, is some you know, it has to do with I think that them not being established earlier. I think there's a lot of division, a lot of rift in, in sport right now. What I think has to do with you know, I'd be almost coming to the scene a little too late in terms of organizing jujitsu. Um, well, let me say, let me I, say hey, yeah. hey, one more because I, I noticed when um, I think you got you and I were competing at the same time. I remember in um. 2000, 2001, the referees didn't have suits on. Um, you know, they're, they're looking over at the other mat, and there's not three refs on the mat. You know, people are looking off and you know making decisions based upon their friends. Or and and then I saw the then I saw the inclusion of the the suits and the people in the chairs, and it really looked like the IBJJF kind of mimicked what the IJF was doing. Yeah. Um, from from what that's for for judokas for, for you know people like Chadi and me it looked it looked exactly like they were t- taking exactly what the IGF was doing and putting it in the jujitsu competitions and and instead of saying hajime they were saying kombatch. Yeah. Well, you're absolutely correct, but that's that that did not start in '94 or early 2000s. It started in '67. In '67, they saw what judo was doing. It's like this works. Our model of teaching private lessons is not excited enough. It can't scale. It, there's, it's hard to grow without a league, without competitions. We need a league. And it had the potential to be profitable, too. So it had all these things coexisting, right, all these different motivations. So 67, they're basically copying the judo ranking system, which is virtually identical. Uh, the uniform, obviously. There's a lot of the rule set of judo that, you know, at least the thinking of judo that makes its way into the rule set. Uh, the, the just the structuring the ranks and all that. These are all things that they were borrowing from judo because they wanted to become more like judo. So this process of copying or raw borrowing from judo never really, you know, ended. It's it it's always been consistent. Yeah, it's been ongoing, right? And then in early two thousands, you're right. I mean, people don't people don't believe me when I say this because if you've been training just for ten years or less, you're probably thinking it's always been this way. I'm telling you, it was. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, and here's and what, here's I, what like you, you could be the way that the rule set was when I was competing. And, and this is why judo changed their rules so that wrestlers can't come in and just win either. You could be a straight judoka and go to a jujitsu competition and you could win because when you we you threw, bam, you hit the ground, come up, two. It was two points. Yeah. And I could throw two or three times, get two points, and I didn't have an obligation to go to you on, on the ground like you have today with jujitsu and ABCC, where judoka could come in win a Brazilian jiu-jitsu competition and, and walk out and leave with a gold medal. And it, it did, it's not that it, 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 it did happen back in the day. Yeah. Well, that's, so that process of separation has been slow and it's like, they're like, the arts have like been drifting apart, you know, since, you know, it's hard to pin exactly when it started. I put 1930s, but I think 19, the decisive moment is really like 1975, like I mentioned, and just, just going back to the, the chaos that jiu-jitsu were prior to IBJJF, I started in 98, okay? I remember 98, referees eating pizza on the mats. Yes. Well, referee, like eating pizza and refereeing. Hot dog. I, 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 yeah, I remember them on the phone, they're on their cell phone while refereeing. They're talking to people while refereeing. I mean, it sounds shocking to people, but this is true. We're not, no one's wearing a uniform. It was very inconsistent. The rules were inconsistent. The ranks were consistent. People weren't making weight. No one was showing up on time. The tournaments would end at one in the morning. There was a, at least one fight per tournament, minimum, minimum one fight. It was like you went to a tournament. You, it was kind of like you're going to like if you're a hooligan and you went to like a football game or something, like a soccer game. You went there like oh, it's on. <laughs> you went there ready to fight, you know, because there's a good chance a fight was going to break out. And you know, if I don't know if everyone listening will read the book or not, but at least read part three where I talk about this, the growth of IBJJF and what those guys did for organizing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And, and one of my favorite quotes is they say, we developed this policy of not negotiating with terrorists. If someone broke the rules, they were going to be penalized, and I don't care who they were. If they were threats. You know, imagine having to tame these guys that for decades have been doing whatever they wanted to do any way they wanted because they were the, were the, the, bad, the bad guys. They were the big guys. You know, they're the bullies. And all of a sudden, these guys come along and, they're, they're young. I mean, Carlinhos Grace is not even the oldest in the family. He's like one of the middle, you know, males amongst Carlos's children. He comes along and starts telling his older brothers what to do. Now, imagine how that went. There was a hierarchy in Jiu-Jitsu. The hierarchies were expected, but they were also abused. Carlos Gracie Jr. comes along and says, no more abuse. We're going to apply standards that apply to everyone, everyone here, including my own students, including myself. And that gave Jiu-Jitsu order and credibility. It's not perfect. Enough it is. But, you know, I think people don't always appreciate the kind of effort that was made in order to give jiu-jitsu credibility. And I, and I argue this, and I do have my disagreements with the IBJF. With that being said, I think they're the leading force behind the growth of jiu-jitsu around the world. I think it's followed closely by Joe Rogan and other celebrities that have helped jiu-jitsu a lot. The celebrities have done a lot for jiu-jitsu. But, you know, in terms of order and structure, that's very important because that's underneath it. I, I, that's that, it's that classic meme of the iceberg, right? What people see the tip of the iceberg and then the rest of the iceberg that's under the water that no one sees. Like, that's what these guys did. They did all this, this work in the background, sustaining the gems, providing systems and rankings and, and consistency to help the growth of the art. You know, it's not, I'm not saying it's not without problems, but, you know, I think it's very important to acknowledge that. So that's part three of the book. And then part four is my, my, my critique of where jiu-jitsu is today and what's happening in the sport. What I don't like about the direction that jiu-jitsu is taking, I'm very critical of that. Um, jiu-jitsu used to be synonymous with MMA. It's no longer the case. I argue that I use this example, but it's in between the lines where, you know, if you have, if you picked up like a mid to high level black belt in the nineties in Brazil, any mid to high level black and you threw him in the UFC, he may not win, but he would put up a fight. Um, in the nineties, any black belt that was mid to high level, if you threw him straight to the UFC, he may not win, but he would put up a fight. That's no longer the case, right? Something changed. The pool of practitioners, of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioners, grew enormously. Yet the, rep like the, 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 the representation in MMA shrunk. So we have less representatives in MMA, even though the population has grown 20-fold. Now, how do you explain that, right? It's because we have gone in a direction that has moved us away from our roots. And in some ways, we're becoming what we used to criticize. And that's my critique of Jiu-Jitsu in a nutshell. 
I'm also very critical of what people are calling American Jiu-Jitsu. The innovation is a product of the United States or the English-speaking countries. And that popularity is because of these guys that showed up in the sport last week. I'm like, bro, read the interview with Orlando Saraiva. There's been a heavy lifting in the 1960s and 70s and 80s. You guys aren't even aware of your own history. And you're going around telling people that jiu-jitsu is popular because of yourself. Like patting themselves on the back. It's beyond ridiculous. It's absurd. It's disrespectful. It's ignorant. So I make my criticism of that as well. Um, and... Pretty much, I wrap it up with my overall thoughts, and you know, where some of my, what some of the, where some of this the business-oriented mindset and the democratization of jujitsu is leading jujitsu. I think the biggest loss has been the loss of rank and hierarchy. Like there used to be a very fixed, rigid hierarchy there. It was abusive. Let's acknowledge that it was abusive in many ways, but there was a level of respect there that's been gone. Like there was the the, the black belt was the authority. Today, the customer, and they use that term customer. They don't say student anymore. Okay? They say customer. The customer is always right. The customer has become the authority. And I think that's to the loss, to the detriment of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I, I would like to, um, if, you, if you don't mind, Chad, I would like to take a deep dive in chapter four with some questions. And that we have, we have this um, on the historical take. And, and, and I, I think you and I, we, we agree. And then on the nomenclature, I don't, I don't think we disagree, but there's a, we agree that a lot of people don't read. They, they don't understand the historical context of the thing that they talk about, especially the newbies that just came in here about 10 years ago. And they're, they're relying off of a, a route that, that doesn't exist. We had a conversation before about jujitsu at this particular portion in time, not having a, a foundational dough or a foundational way to, to pull from. Um, the sport affects the art. Like the sport of judo affects the art of judo, and the sport of jujitsu affects uh, affects the art of jujitsu. My um, fundamental undergearing is that everything morphs and changes, and even as it morphed and changed today foundationally it was still judo that's just morphing and changing yeah. um yeah. and and getting away from those particular points i think we not only do we water down the rank but we also water down the the high in, in terms of the hierarchical ranking there's 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 a respect thing that's in, inside of that how do how do you i guess chapter four and chapter five how do you reconcile and fix these issues on, on the history level and the respect level per the direction that jujitsu is going right now? Because because it's it's headed in a dangerous direction. Yeah, um, I think so. The first one was the 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 the, the respect, and what was the other one? The the respect and the and the the basically ah, history. The ignorance of the of the current practitioners. I, I think that that's it's it's not a jujitsu problem. It's not a judo problem. It's not a martial arts problem. It's a civilizational problem. Like we read less, we've, we're over proud of Google. We think that Google is the same as learning, which is terrifying because Google is not the same thing as thinking, right? It's not the same thing as learning. Google is just a tool to speed up your learning, perhaps. But I think a lot of people take it as I don't need to read. I have the internet, and they and they use you know Google as a reference, and I think. It's, terrifying we read less as a people not just in the united states worldwide there's we're reading less i think educational levels have gone down a lot uh we rely on technology more and more so we're using our brains less and less and we're occupying our brain power with entertainment so entertainment become the highest you know score to be achieved in life as long as you're entertained you got to entertain, entertain fun fun comfort 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 fun entertainment it's like that's occupying a lot of our our capacity as as a species, I think that's the meaning. I think we can do better than that. And I think that I always compare the reading to like working out. So people work out to be fit. Well, you got to read, make sure your mind is fit. The mind needs a workout just like your muscles do. Otherwise, your your mind will atrophy just like your muscles do. I think that's I think it's happening. So I think I don't know how to get people to study more. Like that's a personal preference. It's less popular now than it was, you know, 50 years or 100 years ago because we're overwhelmed with like so much entertainment, movies and 
phones, games. I'm not saying I don't indulge in that, um, but I, I mean, I don't know. What to, I don't think that I don't think it's fixable. I think it's the world has changed too much to fix martial arts is a speckle when it comes to like the grand scheme of life in the world, you know? So who are we to change that? It's, it's too big of a problem for martial arts to tackle. You could try, but you know, and the other thing is there is a, a, it's not even, it's not, it's beyond a hierarchical value. It's a value issue. There's a value issue behind a martial arts. When people think of martial arts, they think of, like this is what they, think of. they think of results in the cage, they think of the physical conditioning, the preparation, right? These things are all important. But before that, there's this little thing called methodology. You have to have a method to train, okay? And what precedes the method is a value system. You have to have a, so you start with the value system. What is it that you believe in, right? What is it that is good? What is it that, what is the direction we're taking? What are the values that we teach on the mats? And that, for example, values of, of tough love. Like, stop whining. You lost. Don't blame the referee. Don't blame the rules. Don't blame the weather. Blame yourself. That's a val- Those are values. Now, you need to assimilate those values even before you get into a, the training, the methodology. We lost that. Like, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in the 80s, 70s and 80s, early 90s, with all its problems, and it had many problems, that value system of accountability was very fixed. It was those were the values. You don't ask for a belt. You don't talk. In fact, if you're a blue belt, you didn't get to open your mouth. When I was 98, 98, that's not that long ago. You didn't get to open your mouth if you were a blue belt. If you're a white belt, you were like, like you were like, you were running errands for the brown belts. <laughs> you were, you, you were the one. You couldn't, ask, you, couldn't ask a black belt, you couldn't ask a black belt to train. You couldn't ask a black belt for a round. It's like you're not even human if you're a blue belt. You're like a cockroach, man. That's what it called. You guys are like cockroaches. Shut up. You know, and and it was it was a joking way. It was not like it was not mean. Like, but it made you want to be a purple belt so you can start giving your opinion. You know, so there was a hierarchy in place that has been replaced by money. Like those, and that messed up the value system because now, like, I heard of someone the other day suing their coach because they didn't get a purple belt. You know, it's like it's, it's gone crazy, man. Like it's the the, the value system has been played on its head. So now everyone's a victim. Everyone's a winner. Here's a trophy. There's all that going on too. So these are worldly values that have made their way to jujitsu because as it became commercialized, it became exposed to the wants of the client. And I think that right there already threw like a monkey wrench in whatever value system existed in jujitsu, which has never been fixed and right. It's been fixed in the culture and it was reinforced by its leading members from Carlos to Helio to Carlson to everyone else that was teaching jujitsu. Like those values were enforced, but it was never written down i think that was a big mistake and that's something that no did right that's what you're talking about there's no dough no there's no dough like it but what Kano did and and i don't know the if three it's, types of education was, these are the values yes before we get absolutely. to the gripping and the throwing and the, there's the education the value, there's the values that they are more important and he saw that now i don't understand which is i don't know enough about judo history or Kano. whatever i know i got from whatever reason I've done in, in the craze series uh, from Roberto Pedrero. But what is clear to me is that it's either because of his mind, like he understood that himself, or it's because it's a reflex of Japanese way of thinking. It might be something very Japanese to think that way, you know, in terms of values. So what, what they did was they created... And Herbert Spencer. A, right, and Herbert Spencer. And like, he's influenced by Western education, from my understanding, right? Like, he's not exclusively Japanese and, and his and the ideas that influenced him. But they under, he understands that you got to frame a can, you have to frame a series of values, you have to create a methodology. And then comes the practice. The practice comes last. And I think a lot of people completely skip methodology, which doesn't exist in jiu-jitsu or MMA. And I've cornered people at the highest level in MMA. And I'm telling you, these guys have no, I mean, it's there's zero order. Very few people have a minimal <laughs> level of structure. There's no science. Like you talk to science with these guys and they're looking at you like, what is oh, science? Have to do? It's like unbelievable. They're fighting for millions of dollars. There is no method. It's chaos. It's chaos. I get, you know, like, what I see? I see these coaches get in a room, fighters and go like this. So what do you guys want to do today? And I'm like, bro. What do you guys want to do today? <laughs> like, want to sit down and eat cookies, like drink lemonade? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> but it's it's awful. But it's it's everywhere. You see this in MMA. So you know, I've always, to me, like Jigoro Kano, like in values, you have the methodology and you have the, 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 the that's the actual practice, right? The, the techniques and the conditioning and all that. I just so I, let me I, ask I, you this. Sure, go ahead. Okay, so 
And here's what I see, because I'm, I'm a judoka at heart. What I see and what I see the conversation evolve into is that what we see in judo happening with jujitsu, jujitsu practitioners are watching happen on the on the on the on the what, what, what we would call the evolution of jujitsu. Of it's going in a in a different direction. It seems like as a judoka, it seems like the people who did jujitsu they took the executable file, but they didn't take the program with them. And now what we're watching is a lot of people who are just gamers. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? For the for the listener, it's, it seems like the the program of, and the coding of what everybody is doing was provided from the. But I mean, let's just if we even remove Kano from the discussion for a moment from the Kodakon. And then what we're doing now, people began to take the the game or the cartridge and then play, and then now people are just getting good at playing the game, but. There's no understanding of, of mutual welfare and mutual benefit. That's because the part we're, we're, we're missing, Chatty. And, 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 and I'm sorry to jump in and interrupt, but like, I just want to say something. And that is so true, what you just said. And it's a huge problem in jiu-jitsu because it's become an individualistic. They're, tr they're turning jiu-jitsu away from judo, which is, to me is a better um, cultural frame. I mean, that's it's a better place for it, for the growth of the art, for the credibility. I think it's a better place. They're turning it into boxing. They're turning it into pro wrestling because that way half a dozen people can make more money. They keep talking about adding more money. If we do this, we're going to be more money, more money, more money. More money for yourselves. The community does not benefit. There's no one making millions of dollars from Jiu-Jitsu. It's one of the half a dozen people. So, you know, I think that we, we lost a lot by, by, by becoming this individualized version of me, me, me. You know, there's a conversation between uh, Kimura and Yamashita that I quote in, in the book. I think it's very descriptive of what you're talking about. It's in, I think it's in part three or four. And um, it, it's, it's, it's very, it's, it's worth reading. It's a short little exchange there, but I think it exposes like some of the differences and some of the problems. And they're not small problems. This individualism, this lack of cohesion just makes everyone think for themselves. And if we're all thinking for ourselves and we're all completely independent and we don't actually believe in anything that we agree on, then what is jujitsu? Then what's the point? Like, what's, I mean, the more division there is, the less of a martial art we have, you know? Uh, Professor Dreisler, I highly recommend you read uh, Mind Over Muscle by Jigoro Kano. There's a place in that book, it's a, it's a very digestible read, by the way. There's a place where he talks about the three levels of judo. The bottom one is all the fighting and fending off attacks and self-defense and just training physically. The second one is how like being an academic, uh, learning from others, uh, observing, constantly doing research, etc. Then the highest level is to, I would like to call it giving back, but he says, you know, being a human being that contributes to society. That's the highest level of judo. And in our ranking system, like... Like my son is pursuing his, he's he's doing the, the 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 ending parts of his black belt right now examination and he's required to teach class. He's required to clean up the dojo. He's I'm I'm teaching him about the business. Of, you don't drink water out of, out of the refrigerator. You bring your water in in a in a in a in a in a water bottle and don't pull the resources from the students. Those are for the students. Um, you 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 need to have you know you gi on and then I need you to learn how to tie and fold your gi and put it together and then show it. like the portions of the of the process of, of judo are so lost right now even when you're online on the internet and you're having a discussion you have purple belts and blue belts going on a full-scale argument with <laughs> what with people who have been training in the art with three and and four stripe black it's it's almost to say it's when I mean it's incredible, I mean it's incredible because it's incredulous. It, I, I can't even fathom the the. What is it called? Um, I, I forget the name of the of the principle where, you know, you think you know but you don't know. Um, it, it's, it's slipping my mind right now. Um, it's crazy. I, I wish the more I had you the know, name. the more you know that you don't know. Yeah, it's like. It it the the level of of ignorance and the 
the full scale thrust of just moving into onto the physical side, which is the lowest level, is where jujitsu has seemed to go. It seems to go like, hey, listen, I'm I'm a badass. I got my black belt. I can tap you. You should listen to me. Yeah, that, uh, that, uh, um, I mean, the, the internet has done that. So I think the internet has played a role and it's shaped the world in ways that I'm, we're still coming to terms with, you know? Um, I mean, I've, I've had people that have been training. They look like blue belts to me. I think based on a quick look on their profile, they think they're blue belts and they're telling me they don't understand the jiu-jitsu. Now I'm not saying I'm the most knowledgeable person <laughs> in the world, but I think I understand the sport inside out. I mean, better than, vast majority of practitioners, including black belts. Like I, I spend a lot of time in the sport of the coach, but be, you, in, the internet has done that. It's like, it's this, it's, it's part of the democratization. All clicks are created equal. All voices are equal. And it's not the case. We know that not, not all clicks are equal, that we know that all no, not voices are, there is such thing as hierarchy. And I, and that, that loss of that, uh, of hierarchy has been, it's affecting jiu-jitsu and it's not a jiu-jitsu problem it's not a judo problem it's a world problem and i think out my for example in, in in judo i think because you go to kind of framed it from the beginning it's more intact i think it suffers less from that also because it's government funded so you don't have the influence of the customer trying all constantly trying to break through that hierarchy because they're the pain they're the pain customer you have more say so if your customers all say they want a 45 minute class what are you going to do if your customer wants more belts and easier belts, what are you going to do? There's a conflict there. I'm not saying we always lose that fight. But there is a conflict. Whereas I think that's something that's structured from the beginning, where it's like more strictly hierarchical, that that it's more resistant to outside pressure. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, because it became so overly commercialized in the past 20 years, it has become very, very fragile in that regard. It's very open to you know pressure from the customer and the individual. And I think that right there, because like, and these are the thing about fashion. Here's the problem with it: like these guys today, Joe Rogan likes BJJ. Tomorrow he's gonna like, you know, horse riding, and then you know, and, and the and people just kind of go. I mean, not everyone, you know, the people like us that are in love with art for what it is. We were here before, you know, it was popular. It's different because I, I think that those are the people that should be, so, you know, guiding the, 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 the future of the sport because we have an invested interest in the sport that is not just financial, it's also financial. Whereas I think that a lot of the people just come in, it's more of a fashion thing. They come and go, they're changing jujitsu to make it easier, to water it down, bring down the quality and the values and disrupt the hierarchies. And when they're done with it, they'll move on to the next thing. You know, so it's a it's the popularization comes with a lot of problems. I don't think everyone thinks it's the greatest thing ever to be popular, but it comes with a lot of problems, and I, I think we should be at least aware of them. Um, I did, there's something that I wanted to discuss. Uh, going back to to the history part, um, you said there was this erroneous erroneous sorry notion where that uh, the Gracies are doing pre like pre Meiji era jujitsu. Uh, and that's why they're more ground oriented. And uh, I actually had a talk with Professor Valente not too long ago. And I would say it's it's not wrong to say this, but it's not that you know pre Meiji era was like its own system. But it's I would say the lack of rules shaped it this way. For example, uh, before the first draft of the judo rules in the 1880s, uh, you either win by uh, tap out. Uh, the guy gets knocked out or he verbally says i cannot go on anymore so there was no time limit there was nothing so yeah. the throw meant nothing and uh guys would be like either dying getting seriously injured and uh, you you read these recollections he threw him over 12 times he threw him with this throw and then he threw him with that throw they went to the ground for example the nakamura fight he went with him when they were fighting jujitsu versus kodokan and they stayed for minutes and minutes on end on the ground. He, he put him in north south and then flipped him over. So but the, I, say, I, I would say that getting the guy on the ground and really suffocating him, it was just simply due to ra lack of rules. So in yeah. a way, and then uh, Professor Valente said that, uh, for example, in Chalky, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's been years, but Horion said, like, we do ju more jujitsu because it's more tailored to the ground like in the past. Well, here's so, the problem. Yeah. Here's my, I, first of all, I'm no expert in pre-Meiji Jiu-Jitsu. I don't, what I know is from the limited 
readings I've done and I've quoted here. Um, but like what we do know, and this is certain, is that neither Carlos Gracie nor Healy or either of their teachers, whether Jacinto Febo, Gio Mori, Maeda, none of those guys had any contact with any style that wasn't Judo. Okay, they all came from Judo. There's no way around it. What, what, what they seem to be saying, what I think this is what Valente is trying to say, and this, this is an argument that could be made, is that Judo in the 1930s or the 1920s was different than Vermont Judo. Like, it might have been a closer to 50-50 ratio, which is what the Gracie family kept all the way to 75, right? From, like, I don't know, I'm not familiar with the, the, the history of the judo rule set, but it seems to me, especially as they start moving towards the Olympic, they start becoming more and more stand-up oriented, less and less ground oriented. That's what's at, at, happened. Like around, like around night, so the last, so it changed because, MMA and jiu-jitsu have influenced judo again, okay? So 19, probably 83, all right, is where we really see the last first portion of, of that of that period of time where we had a lot of what, groundwork guys. That's when we had, Chad, we had Kashiwazaki, we had Neil Adams. Um, the rules were different. Uh, the, the, the mat area was different. It was a lot of groundwork. Um, yeah, much stuff. And then it seems like in 1984, I don't know what happened. In 1984 to 19, I would like to say until around 94, 95. And, and I will say two of the biggest influences in my opinion were three, I would say Nakamura from Japan, Flavio Canto, Jimmy Pedro, and I throw Pablo Mastula in there around that 94, 95, 96 period. Then we start moving towards groundwork again, but then you can see the influence of Brazilian jiu-jitsu on judo to the point where, and this is stateside, you watch referees calling mate soon to not give the jiu-jitsu person an opportunity. And then on the European side, you see them starting to allow a little bit more groundwork. And then it kind of splits, and which is what Chatty has seen in Japan, where your Asian and Chinese and Korean refs seem to call mate a lot quicker than your European refs do when you hit the ground. What do you say, Chadi? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this this kind of happens now in the 2015, 2020 era because MMA and jiu-jitsu, they impact the viewership. So this is what you guys, and I think this is what seems to happen to all They're in constant flow. They're in yes. constant motion. They're never really fixed because they have to adapt. The competitors are shrewd. They're intelligent. They're going to find ways to manipulate the rules to their favor. It's economics. And then doing less in exchange for more. That's just human nature. And that's that's intelligence. So the organizations, when they're attempting to keep the integrity of the art, they have to adapt. So what I think that, that the argument could be said when Helio said that he was preserving real jiu-jitsu, right, was that he was preserving classical judo, which is really what he means, which was, was probably closer to a 50-50 ratio. As judo moved towards stand up, Brazilian jiu jitsu under the Gracie family started moving towards the ground. But there's no there's no rescuing of any samurai or pre Meiji. That's just, that's just, <laughs> no, that, none of that is true. There's, I have never heard, I mean, and I, I remember like, I think on the Shinji Miller, he said like, samurais have nothing to do with jiu jitsu. And that kind of hit me hard at first because I always romanticize that, you know, like, and then I, and then it, that's when it clicked on like, I've never seen anything. That connects. I mean, it's. I mean, there might be, but I've never seen anything. Right. So we romanticize these connections because the samurai has such cool armor and such cool swords. But the truth, they were terrible people, awful people. <laughs> they're not nice. Guys. Um, did, we just. But, uh, sorry, you were saying. Yeah, but yeah, my point is like Helio or Carlos Grace or anyone in the story. They had no idea what pre meiji jiu jitsu was. They had no. What they were doing was it was classical judo which in their defense was probably close to a 50-50 ratio in terms of ground and stand-up. Uh, the 1880s is, I believe, the first uh, Kodokan uh, rule draft was done. But that, that's not to say that other jiu-jitsu schools were taking it to heart because I believe even you know, back then, you know, with the spread of information, I believe things you know, took a long time. But it was, uh, you throw a guy on his back, you two-second pin only, and of course, the tap out. 
Um, later on, they started adding more for the safety, like uh, no wrist locks or, or finger snaps in the 1902. Uh, yeah. But uh, this is to combat, you know, say, because safety, because Jigoro Kano was very much concerned with safety and also education. Um, but to say that it's uh, pre Meiji, that as if they knew what they were actually doing, uh, or they knew what pre Meiji Jiu Jitsu was, that's not the case. Again, it's, it's a lot of things that happened coincidentally because you know, at the time where all these guys were going to um, going to Brazil at the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, they liked to fight, you know, as they pleased. Not everyone was just like, okay, here's the Kodokan rule, let's do it exactly how it was. A lot of guys wanted to go to the ground. They wanted the fight to last longer. They're going to be like, oh, one throw and that's it. No, I'm just going to keep going. And so it, it was a bit of everything. But here, here's what I will say. The real split between ground and stand-up truly happened. I, I, I wouldn't say with the Gracies. Based on my observation, I would say in the early 20s because that's when they saw those Kosen uh, students pulling way too much guard. They were like, stop the hikikomi. I say that's when it truly happened. Well, but I, I think Colson doesn't make it to Brazil though. Like, there's no influence of the, it was because well, they're not not to my. I mean, there might have been judokas that have been more familiar with you know a more ground oriented style, like the Ono brothers. From all accounts, they were Coulson. they had a fifty fifty, yeah, 50, 50 but I'm not sure they were a Colson school. I think uh, they were cool. because let, just let me interrupt you real quick. Their their uh, teacher is uh, Kanemitsu Aichibe. Kanemitsu Aichibe was the head coach that wanted to beat Tsunetane Oda and his team. Mm -hmm. So the ground was everything to them. They would pull guard everything. He's the guy with, that came up with the knee bar, the triangle choke. That's why you see the Onos in the newspaper warming up with the triangle choke. So they were a cross and uh, I would say offset or offshoot or whatever they want because their teacher, one of the greatest contributors to, I would say, 1920s Neiwaza. Well, I, I, like I said, I don't know a lot about this period. Um, my impression is that Colson was something like always taught inside universities in Japan. But it does. It's still there's, it's, and I, and I, there's a footnote in my book where I cannot prove this. I always go back and forth on this one because I think I make a point and I think I, it's a very strong point to be made, but I don't have evidence. So I was like, I probably shouldn't put it in the book. But it's very tempting yeah. not to. But. We know if you watch videos of some of these old uh, old Tsunetani, for example, these guys were doing De La Hiva, X guard, approach bearing bolo. This is in the 1930s, you know, 40s, 50s. And I argue, and I argue, I don't have proof, but I argue that you cannot reach those conclusions without a competitive arena. You cannot reach a conclusion of a De La Hiva without, the, without, the, since without the, thinking yeah, about the competitive situations. Yeah, you in fact said I'm gonna sit down in bed, lay down in bed, and I'm gonna be thinking about moves and tell these no, no, that doesn't exist. People think that evolution is a product of genius. It isn't. Evolution is a product of competition and the need to solve problems. Now, a great mind might have greater solutions to some of those problems, but at the end of the day, it's competition that does that. So there must have been something in that uh, Osaka, the Kansai region the Kyoto region, where these guys had a very strong competition circuit of some sort, if not in the league, at least inside gyms. I don't see a way around. Like, how do you reach those conclusions? Those very sophisticated ground conclusions, right? Because Brazilians took a long time to reach them, right? And Brazilians are very creative people. That's the one thing. It's true that Brazilians are already late for everything. That is true. <laughs> However, they're also highly creative people. Brilliant at improvising on the spot. If you ever hung out with Brazilians, you know what I'm talking about. They'll find, the last second, they'll find a solution. <laughs> and I think this is very ingrained in the Brazilian culture. And look how long it took them to find the, the discovery. Of the oh, I, I give other reasons for this, and it has to do with the reality of combat. We'll talk about that later. But there's no way that they didn't have a very sophisticated leadership. I just don't see it. How could you not? How could you not have hundreds of people in a competitive format so it must have been some very popular ground uh, uh, practice. You know, Niwaza must have been very popular before the Kodokan be became the dominant dominant brand of judo slash jiu jitsu. I, I have a I have a question, man, and it's related to your book, but not related to your book in a roundabout way. If you had asked Shadi and I what is judo, we would have an answer for you. Or we have a standard answer. My my question for you after writing your two books. All right, and doing your documentary, what 
is jujitsu? I have a whole chapter about that. what is jujitsu after all. You know, I really can't I can't define it for you because it's not fixed. What is consistent about it is that it's been consistently changing. It's consistently and like, no, like for example, like Doodle might change its rules and it has changed its rules, but its technical canon, its moral philosophy, these things are fixed, and I think that's a good thing. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu never managed to form that. I think there were attempts, um, but I think, and if this is probably less the, the fault of the Gracie family or Jiu Jitsu's leadership. It's more a product of, of Brazilian culture. It's very, it's very chaotic and unorganized. It's not a lot of structure to things. People, they go with the flow and they adapt to situations as they come, which comes with good things and bad things. But Jiu Jitsu has never been clearly defined in either moral, philosophical, or even cultural terms. Certainly not technical terms, you know, that's even more. I mean, we have how many rule sets, you know. Um, so I, I, for example, you don't present the culture like the, 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 the brand of jiu-jitsu that went on to colonize the world is the beach culture out of Copacabana, really outside of Carlson Grace's gym, the flip-flops, the acai, the laughter, relaxed manners, the hugs, They're not very formal. But today it's changed become Americanized. So when people are complaining about American jiu-jitsu, in some ways it is becoming very American. It's very commercialized. Money, money, money. And like, as, every, you know, how do you live in the United States? The true religion of the United States is, is money. That's our real religion, is capitalism. That's what we worship consumerism more than we worship the lessons of the Sermon of the Mount. And every American citizen knows that. You know, so this is, these things are very important. And jiu-jitsu is absorbing those values. Now, these values did not exist in the 80s. It's not that they didn't like money. It's that there was no money to begin with. So it was easy to stay fixed with a moral code of, of tough love and, and a Spartan code of honor. Like, it was easier because there was no money. Once you flood it with money, it becomes corruptible. And I think that's what's happening to jiu-jitsu is this commercialization. It's good for me as an individual. I live well. I live, as an individual, I live comfortably because of jiu-jitsu. Sounds like I'm shitting on, on you know job here, but you know, but that does hurt jujitsu in the long run. I'm fully aware of that. Like it, me benefiting financially from it does does hurt the art in the long run. And I think that's something Shigoro Kono was more or less aware of when he was so critical of professional fights. I think that jujitsu seems to me like like a moving like like a moving evolving blob that that overcomes something picks it up along the way, use it to change, and it morphs and it becomes bigger. The problem with that is that is what you said. It, it doesn't have a root to it. So it's always going to be changing. So the inability for anybody, even me, to answer what is jujitsu creates, creates such a, for me, it's, it's problematic because I meet a, I can meet a jujitsu practitioner of today, a black belt of today, who has none of the same stuff that I that I had from starting in 1998. Whereas when I meet a judo practitioner, even though if he doesn't know the double leg, you know, defense or double leg takedown, this the there is a level of standardization that they that they know. And yeah. and and I and and I will ask you this, because I heard Keenan Cornelius say this at one time, especially when we move into the no gi space. Do you get to a, a point when it's because it evolves like that in that blob like fashion where it implodes? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> that's if you read the conclusion of my book, is largely around that this implosion. I call it chaos, you know, like it's the no gi thing. Well, it's, it's <clears throat> without structure, without order, any society, any civilization, with any, any martial art, any organization really is, is acceptable to external pressures that will change, modify, or destroy, right? Whereas the more fixed it is, like, you know, the more fixed that hierarchy is, the more likely it is to survive the trials of time, the changes of time, whether those changes are technological or economical, right? When you are susceptible and you're vulnerable to outside pressure, you're constantly reshaping yourself via outside pressure, which is what happens to jiu-jitsu. Why jiu-jitsu is this blob that's constantly changing? Because it's never been fixed in philosophical terms. It's never been fixed in cultural terms. It's never been fixed in even a technical canon. It's completely loose and open, which has its advantages. Right? I, there's a footnote in my book. I draw an analogy with evolution. 
and there's an evolutionary biology reading his book. I have it right here. Is, is there want to check a good? Because I'm, it's, it's on my desk. The origins of order. Uh, Stuart Kaufman. It was recommended by a friend who's a biologist, and he he uses the analogy in evolution, and he goes like this: Evolution takes place at the verge of chaos. If any if any system, if any species is too open to change, it it a lot of like trends and patterns that are potential have potential for growth run through the species, but they're not fixed. They don't stay because there's no it's not fixed, right? Whereas when you fix that genetic setting and you keep it too rigid, now it's it's impermeable to new potential, right? So evolution is taking place on um, imbalance between these two extremes of absolute vulnerability to new 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 information and something that's so fixed that it doesn't allow change. And this is where I'm, it's and when I read that, I was like, man, this is exactly what happens to a martial art. If you if the quarter con if, if the quarter con said you are not allowed to do any takedown. That is not in this original curriculum from 1902. That's Ooh. problematic because you would have never evolved. Now you can write it down and say this is the center, and I argue for a center. I think every martial art should have a center, a center canon. Um, then you should have that, right? Um, what just happened? But, hey, that's a, not, and, and, and we don't want to cut you off, but that shit just. I, it just fucking happened where a throw happened at a tournament, and there wasn't a throw. It, it was, was a takeover. It was a turnover. okay. 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 W whatever it is, but they said if it doesn't have a, if it doesn't have a standard name, they don't score it. Like it's in the Gokyo. Like the Gokyo is like a fix. That's a problem. No, 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 no. It's a problem. It's fucking stupid. Yeah. Because but, you, but, don't, but, you but, don't allow evolution. Yeah, because it, but this is the but this is the problem with evolution. evolution is problematic too because if you leave it up to trends like in the internet does that it's flooded with all this information. There's no there's no thinking. There's no. I have my I have blue belts in mind that if I see armbar from close guard or back take they load they roll their eyes they want to do the boogie choke because it's what they see on the internet. So this is the opposite problem. So the opposite problem of a canon is too fixed and you're not allowed to do anything that's not in the book. Right, the opposite problem of that you do whatever you want, whatever's fashionable, and people going, Okay, well, get choke, it is that's the greatest move. And I have this happened twice now in tournaments where my student lets their opponent pass their guard so they can do it. <laughs> it's just like I want to kill them. <laughs> I, I have a video called the buggy choke nonsense, and I show people either snapping their knee with it, their own knee, snapping their own knee, or that guy in the ADCC trial where he was picked up and slammed. So like, if you learn the basics. You wouldn't have yeah. to resort to this. And I'm not against innovation. I'm not against the boogie troll for the right. I don't think you guys either. But there is a hierarchy, a hierarchy of priorities. And this is what people keep missing. You have standard to standard canonization. Yes, standard canonization. And it builds from there. But there is a center. And then it builds from that. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu never managed to do that. That's astounding to me. But That's here's the thing. There's, here's no, the thing. there's no center. People do whatever they want. But we do know this. All right. Well, and I don't know how, how much has changed because I haven't traveled as much as used to schools in the past five years. I do know that from the Carlson Gracie line, which I'm from too, I could go and find a black belt. I, I know around 2000, and I can ask them, show me the close guard, arm bar from the close guard, choke from the close guard, shoulder jump from the close guard, um, arm bar, triangle from the close guard. Um, Flower sweep, pendulum sweep, and I, like th there was like a closed guard set of skills that you would expect, like a purple belt to definitely have. You, you understand what I'm saying? Well, yeah, you can yeah. you, you transfer in between these chokes and these arm bars. You go for the collar choke, they slide the elbow in, you jump the shoulder, you get, like push the hand, go move to the omoplata. Like th there were basic things, even though we didn't have a standard canon, that you would just expect. You were like, okay, that's a Carlson Gracie guy. Like I could look and see what a car like right now. I can't look and see what a, any guy is. I know what I know what Tenth Planet Jiu Jitsu looks like. And and Tenth Planet's a perfect example of this. Like they they uh it's it's the the they have a cannon, but it's, it's they have a cannon. Yeah, but it's not. It's more. I feel like it's more based on what coolness and trendiness of things than it is on what the most efficient moves are. Because there's a lot of efforts to put in rubber guard, for example. And we all know it's not the most efficient of guards, not even close. 
You know, see people trying it all the time, but it like it worked like one out of a hundred. So I'm not saying it shouldn't be used. I've used it. I've used it for years. With that being said, you know, I've never become an expert at it because I always feel like there were better things for me to work on, like butterfly, which is, you know, generally speaking, more efficient. So the same thing for half, for example. So I think that this, this lack of a of a, a central canon is, is in technical terms is, is something that just would have benefited from early on. And I think there would attend this, but the Brazilian character for all its quality, it does have many qualities, and I'm half Brazilian before anyone accuses me of racism here. <laughs> it is um, it's it's that this this lack of order is very problematic. Like this this the the, the 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 characteristic of the Brazilian way of being comes with a lot of problems. It's not just it's very Brazilian just is very Brazilian in that regard. You get a question, Chatty? Um, I was gonna say. Uh, yes, for example, like the I recently watched this podcast, uh, Ishii and uh, Satoshi Ishii and Oliver uh, Taza. And Ishii was explaining to Oliver how the athletes in Japan get paid. You know, because uh, if you read the, the um, letter for uh, Kano to Koizumi, where he says, you know, I, I'm not against the Olympics, but uh, I would be very uh, cautious when it comes to nationalism and sportification etc and even continues in that uh, where he says uh, i don't want the you know the professional athlete or getting paid from judo the guys in japan they don't get paid from the kodokan or whatever federation oh, they nice. actually get paid by those like things you see stuck on their gi like mitsu uh, i forgot the or like mickey house or yeah they're like sponsored athletes like if you compete or not they will pay you every month a salary yeah. Right, and and they, and they call they say businessman, salary man is what they call themselves. Yeah. yeah. So let me let me let me ask this because I think there's a there's a breakdown in um like under the umbrella of what's in a name because we go we have a we have a gi which we call a kimono. You 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 teach an outside trip in your dojo and you even you Professor Dreiser you call it Osoto Gari. Guy drops down into the after the Osoto Gari, falls into what we call all we can't say Saima because we got Muni Gatami, Yoko Shio Gatami, Kazuya Kase Gatami, Kase, all these are side mounts. So they fall down into a case of Gatami. All right. And then once we get there, or we get, then we start changing the names. Yeah. Why yeah. don't I, I'm, I'm gonna tell you for for me, and and I don't know if Chadi's like this, for me, to me, you are a you are a judoka that specializes in newaza yeah me yeah. who does not know the terms yet and because you're a high level competitor you wouldn't have to know the terms but over a period of time if you bathed yourself inside of the inside of the judo culture you'd automatically know the terms like you know more terms now like you know now that the ezekiel choke is so garuma jimmy now because you've been around long enough um why can't we you utilize these terms, which are the correct terms? I I think I mean I'm not against it. I think that the, the lack of terminology. This is something the tenth planet tried to correct, and I think they did that right. This is an agreement I have with them. Yes, hundred percent. They get these goofy names, and I, I'm again the goofy name is like that doesn't. It sounds more like a joke than something serious, but whatever. It works. It's better than nothing. Okay, uh, but I think that 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 hierarchy is, or that that structure, the naming of things is part of giving the hierarchy structure, right? Is what I'm trying to say. Um, and that's yes. that's pretty no. valid. I think that right. And even if all names can't be named, because I know they're doing variations. There's not one Osotogari. I know there's not one Harayoshi. I know there's not one Uchimata. There are. There's one that's like this, but there are many, many variations to it. And but at least we have an idea of what we're talking about. If you just say Uchimata. Instead, this is how Brazilians describe it. I'm not kidding you. Oh, you know that half guard sweep that so and so did to so and so that one tournament. That's how they describe the move. Instead of naming it, they don't name it, which is odd because Brazilians are so creative. You would think that they would name all the moves. They never did. The move it was just like it was like arm locky, leggy locky, strangulamento, which is so. They had like they had like ten names for like it's like fifth. The vocabulary is like 10, 15 words. Yeah, the Kamuda, Kamuda, Kamuda and Americana. I said, what the hell is it? I, I had, when I started doing it, I had no idea. I didn't know the difference between Kamuda and Americana. To be honest with you, to this day, I still, I don't, 
don't know which one is which. I call and them also, both Udigarami. They're Udigarami for me. Brazil, depending on where you go in Brazil, this is Americana or this is Americana. Like it's it's not it's not clear either. So because it changes from gym to gym. And it it's, it's like, gym. what the hell happened? Because you you came in, you did use the same time as I did. What the hell happened? How do we have this sweep used to be the same sweep for everybody listening? And then it's two different sweeps now. The flower sweep and the pendulum sweep when I was coming out was the same sweep. Yeah. In 1998, the flower sweep and the pendulum sweep were the same sweep. Yeah. When I, I looked on the internet like, <laughs> like a year ago, and I called Lloyd about this. I said, what the hell is going on with the flower? He says, bro, he said, it's changed. You know, the internet has changed the moves. And I say one thing, you know the term flower sweep and pendulum sweep are not Brazilian. They're American. Americans named those moves. Brazilians never did. Brazilians would describe the move. Army Loki, agarrando por baixo da perna. Describing it. They are like when you grab a guy's leg and sweep them. That's how they would describe it. There's no, there's no name. You understand? Mm. And that right there is just, it is symptomatic of the problem. It is a symptom of it. Um, it's, it, I, I think that there's, this is what I would have done. Um, not the position to do that, but like I would have, Select statistically, and I think this is a big, big flaw. There are no statistics, or very few statistics. And I would have organized the statistics, and we would find out what the center is based on the statistics. What are the most common moves in competition? And we frame it now because there's always that thing like, oh, it's too late. It's too late. It's not too late. Do it now. If you couldn't have done it 100 years ago, let's do it now then. Let's, it's on based on the statistics. What are the most common moves? We're going to call at the center and we're going to name them and we're going to put it in writing. And maybe Jeff is going to create a poster and they're going to send it to every gym that's affiliated to them. And this is the equivalent of the, in, in Jew, they call it the, the Q1, the Q2, or they have like the, I've seen those posters. Like they have, I can't remember what they're called. And have the equivalent and then name it and send it to schools and this is what we're calling. Are people going to follow? Maybe. Some problem, most probably won't. Right? Is it too late for it? Maybe, but at least we have something and moving forward, no one can say that we don't have a technical center. And I think that right, it wouldn't be a lot of work. It would not Dr. be Ferguson. Much. Yes. Yes, Sorry. sir. The the um katame no kata. Yes. That could be the foundation for what he's saying. It's I, just structures and it's everything. And it, bro, and not on, not only that, the self-defense portion that that yeah, the self-defense portion that the oh my god, the self-defense portion that the Gracies were teaching that's it's kata, it's the judo kata. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I, can I say something about self-defense? Can I say something about it? Because I and I, I hope I don't disrespect anyone when I say this, okay? But I'm gonna aspire from the hip because I how I feel about it. I think self-defense without Rendor is useless. I think it, it's it. I think you, you take out the glory, and I'm like, what are you doing? It's 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 like dancing. It's like folklore. There's nothing. There's nothing real about it. Like that. You gotta, what's the purpose what, of what, judo? When when I tell people like, oh, they should be running a light, right and left hook. Oh, but an old lady can't knock a guy out with the right hand and left hook. I'm like probably, but she's definitely not gonna be able to twist his wrist and throw her, a fucking attacker over her hip with an ogoshi. That's definitely not gonna happen. In the fight. You know. So some of I, I think that. Self defense without Randori is just a waste of money. And I'm sorry if I'm offending someone. I promise you it's not personal. Don't take it personally. I am very, very sorry if I come across as disrespectful when I say this. I don't mean to be disrespectful. But I don't see how a move that is coordinated. Because here's the thing about fighting anyone's fought knows this. Fighting is about reacting instinctively on the spot, intelligently. So you have to, like, it's not even thinking. It's just your brain connected that I think there's a there's a fiber called myelin that's like the it's like yeah, the, the, the brain inside your muscle. Yes, and it's just it's just doing that. So when someone grabs your wrist, you're already arm dragging and you're going to the back. You don't even think about it. It's just reflex on reflex reflex. The better tuned your reflexes are, the more efficient of a fighter you are. I don't think you can develop that without live action. I don't think you can develop it with just like the the coordinated, you no, know, you, you grab my wrist here, you do that. No, so, so, look at so, so, so here's what people here's what here's what I, I I learned over a period of time too from being in the in sport. There's traditional kata, yeah, and then there's kata. So when you and I let's say we're going, you know how you you have that drill when you're going through the person's legs and you're coming and you're going back side to side through the legs. 
Okay, at the end of the day, we call that a drill, but what is actually, it's a kata. It's just not a traditional kata. Like when you yeah. do uchikomi back and forth and you walk into that you it's a kata. It's not a traditional kata. When you're sitting there and doing osoto back and forth and osoto back and forth, it's kata. It's just not a traditional kata. When you practice, you grab my you grab my lapel, I grab the sleeve, step tao toshi. That that's kata, but it's not traditional kata. So you gotta yeah. get to the point where you practice and develop proficiency, and then you develop efficiency through live drilling, and then you can go and move in into randori. But without doing that, with just practicing the mood, like when people go into places. No, I, I'm with it. I just want to clarify my stance. I, I think when you're, and this is how I, this is my methodology, right? It's not perfect, but I think it's better than what, you know, is being taught currently in BPJ gyms. I always introduce a move in a kata format, right? So it's no resistance. And I always like, to, it's, it, students get that part quickly. Oh, hand here, foot there. Unless the move is like very like like a bearing bowl is not an easy move for students to grab, but most moves are pretty simple, like a like a key lock, you know, hand here. So then once they get that part, which they normally get in five ten minutes, okay, now we're gonna practice with mild resistance, which is how wrestlers like to drill. Wrestlers, I think wrestlers like they drill intelligently. I really like the way wrestlers train, and we should talk more about wrestling because I think wrestling adds a lot to this equation. Uh, but like it's the resistance that teaches your body how to deal with resistance. That's the key to knowing the move is not memorizing it. If that were the case, we need to train. We just go on YouTube. We need to learn how to do resistance, and that, and that, 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 that the, the friction between my attempt and your defense, right? My office and your defense. That's where the learning process takes place. So that right there is that it's the, the 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 border between I am barely able to do a move and I am unable to do the move. That border right there is where learning is taking place. So if my partner is constantly resisting with me and giving me mild levels of resistance. I am forced to adapt and improve in the process. And I, I don't, I, when I see people drilling Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I, lot of see, I see them stuck in phase one where you're doing the move, but there's like no resistance. And I'm going, man, you got the, the, the coordination down. Let, don't, now practice it with movement. Practice now, it with now, mild now, resistance. This, Professor Drysdale, here's the thing. Judo makes space for somebody to achieve their black belt in that particular area. Be because of the three different levels that we have. So there's some people who just want to do, they just want to do it because they just want to learn the standard canon of throws, learn the history. They don't ever want to fight. They don't, they just want to do kata. They can't, listen, they can't bust a grape, my man. If if you if you put a fan on in the dojo and play some loud music, they'll trip over themselves. But they can end up being a black belt in judo because they know they know of the gentle way, and 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 it's and that's that's another discussion right there, Roddy. What constitutes a black belt? That's I, my suggestion, and I and I I haven't suggested this, Jeff, but they're not going to do it. But like I think that they should. Is I think there should be three levels of black belts, different like like something that differentiates the academic, practitioner, the... coach, and fighter. They're different. Yeah. They're not the same. The academic they're the same also, belt, no. they're we, we say, Chadi. Uh, like an academic black belt, like those people who do well in tests and yeah, they, they, they have that, and they do well. They do the kata, they do the test, they know the history, they know all the yeah. paper. And you know, we we understand that there's black belts like that, and then there's then there's a regular, you know, black belt, and then there's a high level black belt. You know, there's there's, 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 there's a difference between a guy that trains twice a week for tw 15 years straight and gets black belt, and some of these blue belts that are eating the mats. You know, they're sleeping on the mats and they that's all they do. And then by the time they get a black belt, they're, those two black belts are not equal. And then there's a guy who's an outstanding instructor, but he can't, he's not a champion and he okay. never will be, you know? And I think that there should be a hierarchy, like some kind of distinction because at this point, because there are so many practitioner and recreational black belts out there, the overall and it's, and it's level quality and credibility of the jiu-jitsu black belts gone down. Because 30 years ago, they were all fighters, almost exclusively. Everyone put their hands up and fight if they had to. Now, the vast majority of them are not prepared for a real fight, but they're black belt, but they're not prepared for a real fight. So I'm going, like, the, the credibility of the BJJ black belt, which was very high 30 years ago, has gone down a lot. And as I argue, we have become what we used to criticize. It's, uh, let me tell you a funny story, and uh, Dr. Ferguson knows it. Uh, like, uh, Kodokan recently talked about ranking and they said it's not the strength it's not the but it's how well they understand what judo is 
te technic technically how they are, their their attitude, what they are giving back, so to speak. It, it's a bit uh, flu, but I think I know what they're getting at. But when I got my black belt last year in Japan, in Kolokan, I was uh, in a layover in Taiwan and I was thinking to myself, and I had this like, uh, like uh, what do you call this moment? Like, it's a, it's a realization moment. Yeah, but it, it was yeah. good. I realized I don't know anything. <laughs> and <laughs> I, <laughs> I feel like I had everything. Yeah, and, and I, I remember like I, I, I spoke with Dr. Ferguson. I was like, Dr. Ferguson, I don't know anything. What do I do? <laughs> I just got my black belt. I don't know anything. Everybody's like that. I think everybody. I think everybody gets when you, when you get your black belt, you have a level of imposter syndrome sometimes, and then it, it's, especially in the in the Brazilian jiu-jitsu community, which is different from judo. In judo, when you get your black belt in judo, you don't really feel like you have a target on your back at practice. Hmm. My God, in jiu-jitsu, like this this probably still happens. Like Professor Drysdale and I, we gotta probably do the same thing. Like if I'm not, sometimes I'm feeling up to it when I go to another place to teach, and sometimes I'm not. If I'm not feeling up to it, I have the posture of I'm coming in here, gentlemen. I'm an older guy. I'm just going to come in here and teach, show you guys some moves, and I'm leaving. Sometimes you get in the gym and you know, you're like, oh, I'm not going to be able to fucking pull that move today. I said, after I show some shit, we're going to have to, <laughs> we're going to have to, we're going to have to fucking roll before I leave here. Now, now, and whether you win or lose, your ability to, to be received next time or to re be received by the community. It's going to be based upon how you don't have to beat everybody, all right? And and I'm at the point sometimes I'm older, I just got to survive. You, you understand what I'm saying? But some of the young cats, they want to, they want to see, well, let me see some of this old school shit work, motherfucker. <laughs> no, and, and and I, I'm, I'm 41 going on 42 now, so, and I have arthritis all over my body. I can't roll like I did five, 10 years ago. I can walk in any seminar. I've done this multiple times every 40 people at a seminar 50 people and i line them up and i go when i went and i go like this i top them all i can't do that anymore but the guys kind of still expect me to. <laughs> it's like I threw it up. i'm not doing that i ain't doing that there's no way on earth i'm doing it. and the other thing is like whenever you do train with people like yeah you are constantly challenged and like and this is there's a problem now we have conflicting hierarchies you see there's a conflict here we have one hierarchy that is age and rank and then we have the other hierarchy which is like who's the better warrior here and as you are younger, no doubt you are a better warrior. You're more fit for combat if you're in your 20s than you are in your 40s. <clears throat> However, in your 40s, you have wisdom that in your 20s, I only wish I had. Oh, boy, my life would have been different. I don't know. I go back and forth. I wish I, if I had a time machine, I wonder if I would have done things differently. I don't know. Maybe. But, you know, it's, it, there's a conflict there. And that's not something that I'm not sure, because I've, I've never done judo, as you guys know this. I know of judo through jiu jitsu, but I've never. Hey, I want to keep that higher. Every day. Because in Brazilian jiu jitsu, it's not clearly defined. It's not clear who is the alpha dog, the wise guy, or the guy who beats everyone up. There is, it, the, it coexists on the mat, and there's some level of respect, but this is the kind of thing that causes a lot of conflict in gym and leads to this. This is one reason why BJJTs are constantly splitting, is because these hierarchies are not clear. Like, I think this is something that, to some extent, from you know, from the little I understand of judo, like get fixed because in judo, the hierarchy is is more established, right? So you have you know who's in charge and they're on the mats, and you know that even an Olympic champion, you still bow down to me because I'm a, I'm a sheep or whatever, you know. Uh, this is this is a big problem I think is why people don't realize it leads to a lot of political rifts in jiu jitsu. Uh, well let, let, let me um let me ask you this. When we talk about Carlson Gracie, all right, how did Carlson Gracie get removed from the position that you think he should have in the historical context? Well first of all this that's a very good question because that's it it just touch it's got to the bottom of the map why most people listening probably never even heard of him and yet here we are arguing that he's probably the most important figure in the history of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um first of all he's a black sheep in the family. Why is he the black sheep? Prior to him, like I said, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu was something limited to self defense classes aimed at Brazilian elites. It was not something for the masses, at least as it was taught in the, the Gracie Academy. There were others like George and Fada who had taught in groups, you know, uh, into like, you know, 
not necessarily the wealthier areas, but they never became main, they never became like huge um, successful teams. Like George had good students, but he never became like a, a coach that Carlson was. And same thing was Volvo Father. <clears throat> so he was a black sheep because he upset Helio, who was the patriarch, not the oldest, but he was pretty much the political leader of the Jiu-Jitsu throughout the 60s and 70s in Brazil. And it upset Helio that Carlson would teach to random people um, that weren't, you know, because they didn't want, people didn't want was Jiu-Jitsu growing beyond uh, his control. Like he was, he was a very important political leader, but he was a very controlling kind of personality. He wanted his kid on top. So the hierarchy was himself, his children, his nephews, his favorite students, and then everyone else, right? Carlson comes along and says, forget all that. I don't care what your last name is. We're going to train. You want to train hard? Let the hierarchy on the match, let your efforts determine who's the boss. That's that. And he created that competitive environment that didn't exist before him. And this made him black sheep in the family because how could you be training people to beat your own family? And Carlson answer is, there's a, there's a video on YouTube about this. He's like, what kind of coach would I be if I told my student, you have to lose because you're going to be fighting one of my cousins? And, and this, I guess, a perfectly good question. is like, what kind of coach would he be? So Carlson, he changes all this. He's like, I don't care what your last name is. I will train you. And then he had his beef with he, which is a very important piece of this history. And then he kind of wanted to rub it in Helio's face. It was pretty petty of him or whatever the case, but from all accounts, he took great pleasure in beating Helio's students. And they did. They dominated because they were training competitively in a way that the students at the Grace Academy were not. So they didn't stand a chance against Carlson's students, right? This is why Carlson dominated for three decades, or almost three decades. So that's one reason, right? He was a black sheep. Uh, the second reason, he had only one son. Unlike Carl Gracie, his father with 21 children, Helio had nine, you know, 21. in one generation of family between two brothers. That's not even counting the other ones. Uh, Carlson had one, and Carlos, Carlson Gracie Jr., he's in Chicago. He's, you met him? I might have met him. He's not a professional marketer. He's not one of those. He's not Horian. Horian is a very bright businessman. He was the right guy for the job. Carlson Gracie Jr., is, he's, he's just, his, you know, his father's son. He's a regular guy. He's not a... He's not a marketing force. And I think that was part of it. The other part of it was as you just blew up the world in the early 2000s, that was exactly when Paulson's team had the diaspora, right? The exodus of all these his elite black belts that would have carried his name on. They were not to form Brazilian top team and American top team. And I don't think people realize that those two teams, who are the biggest MMA teams in the world, they traced their lineage directly back to Carlson Gracie. Uh, but for reasons that I, you know, they're in the book. We have this is a very controversial topic. I don't want to get into it. But that split in the late '90s, early 2000s, is what you know. Those black. I think Valid says this in the book. Like the your black belts are the ones who carry on your legacy. And you know, and Carlson lost his leading members early in the when right when jiu-jitsu was taken off around the world, and they never, they never didn't continue that tradition of being the dominant force in Brazil like they had been for the previous 30 years. And I think that those three reasons combined, I think, help explain why Carlson is not remembered as he should be. You know, members of the Gracie family, and I'm not going to say all of them, but some of them, they deliberately bury his name. It's deliberate. I'm convinced. Because they know, and the best quote, it's my favorite quote in the book, or one of my favorites at least, where Carlson Gracie Jr. was like this. You ever watched that movie, The Lion King, when everyone means the, everyone, the, the, the name Faza is mentioned and everyone just trembles in fear? Or it's the same with my father. And I think that's spot on. Because if you ask, if you talk to some of the hardcore Grace, the ones that are fighters, if you say Carlson Grace, they go like this, Carlson was the man. Right? But if you talk to some of the other ones, they're like, they're very hesitant to give him credit because they know what Carlson did. They know he was the best fighter in the family and he was the best coach in the family. But they cannot give him credit because he never had that. He, he, he breaks with Hilo's model of, centralizing jiu-jitsu around himself and his family and the academy. Carlson says jiu-jitsu for everyone. As long as you train hard and as long as you want to be a warrior, you are welcome to my team. And he drops the prices and he didn't even charge most people. He was a completely giving human being. Like this is the kind of guy who would literally take the clothes. Literally, there are multiple like, uh, uh, um, you know, testimonies of this happening when he takes his watch off and gives it to people, he takes his shoes off and gives it to people because he didn't care. To him, it was about, oh, man, as long as you come to my gym and you train hard, right? So on top of that, he was a very giving human being with no interest other than just watching his team and his students win. So I think for all these reasons, Carlson's a very, very neglected uh, piece of this history. 
and like and if you read the the, 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 the interviews with the members of the Grace of families, they they they're pretty much saying the same thing. They always clearly say it, but it's odd that yeah, he didn't get the credit he deserved. And this guy is the guy who created the, the brand of jujitsu that we train today. When I say created, I use that term loosely, not as literal creation, but he he nurtured the kind of culture and training environment where 99.9% of BJJ practitioners practice today, which is the randori, the loose manners on the mats, the beach culture. The hesenia, these... the hesenia at the end, yes. Hesenia, yeah, yeah, exactly. The showing up five minutes late. That is as descriptive as Carlson Gracie as can be. Have you seen his fight against Santana, the, the black and white? Uh... Incredible. You know, funny. Can I just comment before? I'm sorry, yeah. about it. I have to say this. So, I, 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 the crew from the UFC, they were doing this documentary on the 30 years of the UFC. And they wanted to know more about the history of all these two members. So, they reached out to me. And I said, man, don't, I'm not even going to talk to you anymore until you watch Carlson Grace and Valdemar Santana in 1956. And you tell me that's not a proto UFC fighter in 1956. It's unbelievable how ahead of his time he was. Dr. Yeah. Ferguson, yeah, yeah. Dr. Ferguson, he does an uchimata, gets back up, and then he does an uchimata with the other on the other with the other leg. Yes, both sides. I heard it's very hard to do. Oh I can God. I can barely do it on one side. Oh. Very few judokas can hit uchimata on both sides. Both sides. Very few judokas can hit uchimata. Period. Period. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you watch in terms of his thinking, and I. And that fight, it kind of like it hit me hard when I saw that because he is fighting like a less evolved UFC fighter. The UFC took all this time to get to where it's at today. When you watch him in 1956, the ingredients are all there. He gets taken down. You know what he does? He stands back up. It's Carlson Gracie. He takes his jacket off. He breaks with his uncle. This happened in one of his fights, I think, with Pasarito. Mid-fight, he takes his, his gi jacket off. He is striking. He is kicking. He's closing the distance he's maintaining distance it's like and you watch him it's like these these are all the elements that you see in the ufc today now we take these things for granted because it took so long to get there if you were talking about volley food in the 1930s 40s in brazil these things are not so obvious because these guys didn't know what was going to happen right now we know and i think it was not just Carlson, and guys like ivan gomez and oclid spereira and they, they they were very important characters here too they um um I think people underestimate like how ahead of their time these, these men were and that they were pretty much set the framework for what the UFC would be one day. And I think Carlson's the leading figure. So this is why like he is not only a central figure in BJJ history, Carlson is arguably the most important figure in the 20th century for MMA as well, for Valitudo, not just BJJ. And so he stands out in both those realms. And it's unbelievable when you think of because most people can't be successful is one thing. Like Carlson was outstanding coach in gi, no gi, MMA, outstanding. the best fighter in the family till this day. There's not a member of the Gracie family who's done better than him in the ring till this day. You can't find anyone. I think Hens and Hoist come close, but not really. I mean, God, I mean, the, the fighting pool was certainly smaller than it is now, but still, it's pretty incredible what he did when, when, you, when you think about his overall career. I, I always like to ask you about this, this figure and um, George Meiji. So Meiji, I was living in uh, Massachusetts for a time when I was training with Jimmy Pedro. And I was training at this club where they had, Meiji had come in to town to train and he had seen a picture of Helio Gracie on the wall and they were telling me about the story. And Meiji grabbed the picture of Helio <laughs> Gracie and, and tore it up and said the dude was a liar. This is what he said. Um, I heard of, I've never met George Meiji. I've heard about Meiji in the judo community. And Joe Moreira used to train with George Meiji. And so did Valigi used to train with George Meiji. Joe Moreira told me, he's like, man, I, I learned judo first. I, I, he says, he said, Joe Moreira told me, he says, man, this, this is all judo. Joe Moreira told me this. And I don't know if you've ever seen Joe Moreira on the mat. He moves really, really slow. Super, super deliberate. Everything is just really, really tight. Osakomi Waza with some submissions. Um, 
tell me about tell me what you learned historically about Georges Meiji and explain to the to the listeners. I know we're I know we're getting close to ending, but explain to the listeners who this who this uh, character is that you speak about in your book, both your books. Well, um, I, I I never met him. We tried to interview him for the first book. He's a very humble guy. He didn't want to be interviewed. And when Flavio Bering reached out to him over the phone and said, you know, these guys, this crew from the United States, they want to interview you, he would say, like, I don't have nothing to say. I'm a no one. What do I have to say? You know, like, very and humble. He, and then he passed away, unfortunately, yeah. Right after that, he passed. I, if, I, if I had a time machine, this is the one thing I do regret, I would have camped outside his gym and I go, I'm not leaving until you talk to me. You know, because I think I had some, there's a lot of things I would have asked him. And I mean, he starts with the Gracie family. He is, you know, he didn't, he didn't train judo when he was in France or um, uh, Algeria. He was, is it Algeria? I can't remember now. I think he was born in Algeria, but don't quote me. Um, and then he goes for his strength with his family. He has a fallout with Hebeo for very reasons that people don't like to talk about. It's not clear why, but, you know, Meiji was, yeah, he did call Helio a liar his whole life. He did not like Helio. He thought very little of Carlos and Helio in general. He had a great relationship with Carlos. They were very good friends. Um, at one point, um, Meiji, uh, Meiji goes to um, goes to Japan. He trains with Kimura. He trains with Isao Kano. He trains with all these elite judokas. Comes back to Brazil, continues. Now he's a full-on judoka. He abandons the term jiu-jitsu. He's just immersed in the Kodokan, Kodokan sphere. And but he maintains a very healthy relationship with jiu-jitsu practitioners. It was not it would be not be unreasonable to say that he had played a role in the development of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because a lot of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioners in Rio, during what I call the second wave, the wave that went on to colonize the world, trained with Medi. And Medi, from all accounts, was a library when it came to ground moves, when it came to Miwaza. He was like an encyclopedia. And a lot of guys said that, like he was a very, very knowledgeable guy at a time where the jiu-jitsu technical canon on the ground throughout the 60s and 70s was not that sophisticated. Remember, these guys didn't even know the triangle, the sevens, the sankaku. They didn't even know that move. So Medi, I mean, don't know how much he brought from Japan with him, but considering who he was training with in Japan, it's not unreasonable to suggest that he brought over a lot of techniques that you know indirectly might have made or directly might have made their way into the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you know, overall canon, not officially, but you know, through passing from one division to the other. Because a lot of people sought out his 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 knowledge in, in, in terms of judo, and I I think that they probably learned a lot from him on the ground as well. But that the the narrative has been so constructed in a way not to allow the uh, the accept or accept that. They, that he would have learned some, that jujitsu would have learned from a judoka. I think that's that makes it kind of, it, it, it's, it's almost like when you talk to some of these guys, it's almost there's a block that they don't, they refuse to challenge the official narrative because it's like they're loyal to it. It's almost like to them, it's almost like a religion. It's like you can't challenge these guys, even though they know that some of these that they said aren't true, they're still very right. hesitant because they feel this loyalty towards the original Gracie Academy. They, and, that, and I think I mean, they file their judgment all the times. You know? it, it's a, it even states that Hickson was one of his students. Yeah, one of his black belts. And Hickson uh, has good judo, man. Hickson has really good judo. Well, hell, that's, that's what he's doing is judo. <laughs> In those days, they, they, they practiced a lot of... Uh, they practice a lot of, uh, um, of judo. Um, a stand-up, right? Like, it's, stand-up was... You know, it was, remember, up to 1960. Holes, Gracie, was good, man. Holes was good on stand. Now, Holes. up to 1964, the split between their practice was close to 50-50. That's why you watch old school video, old school footage of the Gracie family training in the 50s, 60s. They're standing the most of the time. You see he Hugo doing Uchimadas, and it's like, he's, he looks more like a judoka in the ground. I negotiate. say Let me say this on the, on, Helio... Was a judoka. Was a judoka. Yeah, I, I have to agree with that. He was a judoka, even though he hated judo. There's no around it. And when I say judoka, judoka, I'm not talking about. I'm not even talking. About, oh yeah, because jujitsu came from judo. No, no, I'm talking about you watch him move. And if you pick a random practitioner today and you saw him move and you didn't tell him he was Julio Gracie, you would say, "What is he doing?" They would say he's doing judo. He's a judoka he's because judo. he, like, there's no ground um, rotation. It's crystal clear in the rules there once again. Like it's very obvious. 
I have a question. Um, with my last talk with Professor Valente, he said that there was uh, supposedly a plan between uh, CBJ, which is uh, the Brazilian Federation of Judo, and Gracie to kind of like work together, but he said they had a falling out due to politics. So I it don't wasn't know like the, the, they, they uh, like in the book, it says that they clearly wanted to distinct themselves and, you know, the, the, there was something in the works, but they had a falling out. So I don't know that. What, what we do know is that, you know, up to like the mid 90s, you could not just start a federation in Brazil. You had to have government approval. So for you to have a federation or a confederation, right, like a nationwide league, you would have to have government approval. So it was not easy to do. Like they, they tried, I think in 1951 is the first time they tried. They finally got it in 67, but it didn't become official until 73. And then that's when they created their first league. So what could have happened, I don't, I don't know anything about this event you're describing, is that because they couldn't get an approval, they kind of sought out to work with judo possibly. And because they probably needed the credentials that they didn't, like didn't have government approval. But as far as like, I think the 1970s onwards, I don't think the compatibility, it was, I don't think they would have agreed. I think if you put like a bunch of guys and 50 guys in a room and said, let's organize a tournament, they would have had, it would have been endless arguing about what the rules were because I don't think yeah. you could have gone this way. So in the 1950s and 60s, I think maybe you would have reached a common ground. I think yeah. from 1995, I just don't see how. Yeah. Let me, uh, let me, I, I, yeah. Let me ask you a question very, very quickly. Um, going back to George Meiji. Meiji starts ju doing jujitsu, goes to goes to Japan and comes back. And then when he comes when he comes back, he's then calling Hillier a liar. Is is this because he he figures out that he's doing judo? I, I, I think that you know, Helio constantly attacked judo in the press. Like he, That's why I asked. Yeah, oh, it was okay. constantly attacking them. So, so it's, you know, Meiji, like he became a judoka, man. He became a trooper for the Kotokan. So he probably felt offended by that. And then it's like, man, what are you talking about? Yeah, you're, right. doing, like, you're attacking your own roots. Like you are, and Helio stuck there that he had, you know, the first he was saving and then he learned from Carlos and then he invented it and then he was, or then he would learn from watching, he was saving it. Later he created it. Like it was, you know, Helio bit looks like Helio was undoubtedly a very important figure, especially in political terms of jiu-jitsu. But it's clear that the guy had a big chip on his shoulder. Like that I mean, that goes without saying. Like he had a massive ego and he liked the, he liked to be the center of attention. And I think he I think that was part of the problem with Carlson is that in the nineteen sixties and seventies in Brazil, Carlson was a man. And Helio couldn't stand that. Like he, he, he was very jealous of Paulus Gracie too. This is according to Hala Gracie's account of, of the relationship too. It's not, uh -huh. it's not saying that. But he was a very controlling and you know, you know, big ego kind of guy. And he didn't like, you know, like any kind of jujitsu that wasn't what he understood jujitsu to be. Right. So if it worked to him, if it worked to him, I don't think jujitsu would have grown beyond the self-defense practice that it was at his academy. And I think we have never heard of the gym had it not been for Carlson. I would Man, say, I, 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 I would say uh, the whole thing that why is it on the ground or why are these guys more stand up? There's just not one answer. It's a continuous flow that that had a little bit of phases. Like I would add also the the Kosa part where they went to Brazil, like the Ono brothers, that I would say that affected the ground aspect quite a lot. And then, like the final nail on the coffin, as you said, was the Valley to the rule set. Yeah, I and 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 that's something to the credit of the Gracie family, is that they did. There was an effort, it was a conscious effort, of of keeping a martial side of judo alive. They wanted to make it. This like they had this martial interpretation. They're very influential. Yeah, Timmy Watson. Yeah, exactly. They, and they, and if you, you watch them, these guys sparring, they're kicking, they're slapping, they train with slaps. It was it was something. It was a design for a fight less than it was for a sport. Although their federation certainly creates a conflict that, that in jiu jitsu never really quite solved. You know, it's still it's still there. Is it a sport or is it a combat art? And, you know, jiu jitsu is somewhere in between. 
but um, yeah, I think that you know, there's, there's, I think this story is fascinating. I think that there's so many different angles you can take. I hope Dr. Pickett is coming out with a new book called Craze Four and Five. He's got two new books coming out. They're not out yet, but I you know, apparently he bumped into all these these documents that are untouched, have been, and they're never they've never been published with crime stories in in Japan. So I think we should get a lot of good stuff coming. I'm very curious to see what's gonna what's going to come about, but I think a lot of questions will be answered about this earlier period and in, in the development of judo slash jiu I'm really curious about it. So I think it's definitely worth checking out if, if when, once it comes out. Yes. I, um, a few years ago, I had the honor and the pr- privilege and pleasure of promoting uh, Professor Ricardo Laborio to second degree black belt in, in judo, Nidan. We we need to we need to purposely work on getting you your black belt and judo, Professor Drysdale. So behind the scenes, you know, listen. Th- th- there's a couple. There's a couple. A little bit of history and some hoops you got to jump through. Your Nawaza is good enough. All you have to do is put all the names to the stuff that you already know, because according yeah. with, with Chatty and I, you are you are a judoka, my friend, and and we need we need to make sure that the next within the next six months, man, we we get this black belt on you, my man, because uh. First. First, I have to hit an uchimata, a perfect uchimata, because like I drilled that move a million times, but never quite hit it. That's the case. It's going to take my red white belt away. I don't. <laughs> I, it was. It's always sloppy, man. It's always sloppy. I have to. I actually, I, you know, it's funny. A little off topic here, but you know, I, I was never. I never. I said zero judo up to black belt, like zero. Like people were grabbing me, like oh shit. I would shoot a double. I'd shoot a single, or I'd pull guard. I could never. That's judo. Hey, hey, hey Chidi, will you please tell them this? Listen, you, you listen. Some of you, you just you guys kill me. Say I don't have any judo. Listen, if you when you're on them when you're doing the Nawaza, you're doing judo. When you shoot a double leg, you're doing yeah. judo. When you shoot yeah. a single. Okay. okay. Judo. When it comes to takedown, I just want to say this to all jujitsu guys. This is judo and it's takedowns. Everything in that circle is judo takedowns. The wrestling takedowns are a circle within that circle. No, no, I'm, I'm with you. But what I'm saying, like, my stand-up, my, my throws. I shouldn't have said you. Your tachiwaza. Your tachiwaza. Come on, start saying it. Start saying it. Tachiwaza. Well, you know when I started cooking? Oh, this is when I started using the Uchigari and Harai Goshi and the Uchimaza. You know when? You know when? You know when I started working? When I started wall wrestling, because I was doing MMA, and I would be upright with these guys on the wall all the time, and the Uchigari became one of my best moves on the wall. And I started hitting high goshis on the ball. And I started hitting uchimatas off the clinch. And these are things that never, I never actually even come close to. But it was like, thanks to MMA, that like, I finally got to use the judo throws that I knew of in theory, but I've never been able, I've been, I never put in the time to learn in practice. So like, I have MMA to think for whatever little, not Tatachi Waza, I know. <laughs> Listen, we, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to make it happen, Professor Drysdale. We're going to make it happen. And, and luckily, I would love to see it. listen. Luckily, I am able to get that done on my own because I am a I'm a certified rank examiner. So I just gotta I gotta walk you through the I gotta walk you through the paces, my man. I walk you through the paces and we get that done. We'll have to talk about it. <laughs> and he didn't agree, Chaddy. So we got some more work to do. Yeah. No, what are you talking about? I'm, yeah. I'm flattered. I'm flattered, but I, I do have to put in the work. I, I know that. Oh, 100%. But here's the thing. The thing about judo, and this is what is what a lot of people have to recognize, is that you have people in judo who have only tachiwaza and no newaza. Yeah, yeah, black belt. Yeah. Black belt. You have people in judo who have only newaza and no tachiwaza. You have people in judo who have done only, only kata. Like, they study history in kata. That's what they, that's it. They have never competed. They've never done randori not once. That's just what they do. You have yeah. people who who, have, who study the who study the um, the weapons form of the kata that we have in judo, and that that's just all they do. So we we make space for a lot of different a lot of different ways for people to to get their black belts. But that but that being said. Um, if you have not gotten Professor Drysdale's books, books, all right, I would recommend both of them. I highly recommend both of them. They're, they're linked avail- down below. In okay, the yep. and they're available on Amazon. Um, Professor Drysdale, can you close this out and tell us when we can expect the documentary to come out, and and when will you, where will you be next? Because you've been all over the world. 
Um, yes, I will be in Poland. Actually, I'm going to be in Missouri and on the 1st of June. No, no, the 2nd of June. And then Canada on the 3rd or 4th. Now, I think Missouri on the 3rd, Canada on the 4th for the World Jiu-Jitsu Expo coming up in uh, Ontario. Uh, and then the next week, I'll be in Poland for a week. And then I'm back for a little while. I spent some taking my kids on a vacation somewhere. I'm not sure where yet. But um, and then the documentary will be out before the end of the year. It's a docu series. I'm not sure where it's going to be published. Like we, it's just been a nightmare. It's been so difficult to pull this off. You guys have no idea. And I'm going to make zero dollars from it. In fact, I'm losing money on the thing personal. At this First point. time we spoke was three years ago. Yeah, well, like it's it's been it's it's, a, it's been a five year six year operation now. And I'm still having problems. So it's um, it's something that, in hindsight, I almost regret to be honest. Like almost like I wish I had never touched this. But again, you know, I think it's something that 20 years from now I'll be I'll be proud of. You know, it's just like because I'm going through the shenanigans. It's just like, man, why am I just focused on making money? I could be using all this time and energy to get rich. You know, like here I am. Like at the end of the day, man, people most people don't care. You know, you're, you're, you are creating a legacy for yourself. Well, it's not, it's, I mean, it's, I, it's I, what you I, leave behind. We have, well, thank you. But when I see guys like, like Carlson get left behind and I see people, you know, raising to pedestal people who have, haven't done a horrible role he has done as a fighter, as a coach, it kind of like, there's part of me that goes, this thing, right. You know, this is just absolutely wrong. You know, I wanted to do my part and try to correct it. So I think that's part of the motivation, but the document has been difficult and it's, but I, it's, it's going to come about. It's going to happen. It's just been a lot of work. And I hope I hope that, you know, if I can pay my investor back, I'm, I'm happy. That's all I care about. Well, I, I've said this to you before, and I'll say it again. And I'm saying this for the people who are listening. Is there, any, is there anybody in that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu space who is um, on a board or uh, is an associate dean or associate professor anywhere? I truly believe, and I've 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 read I've read the open the close guard. I've, I've only read about fifty percent of your your second book, um, but I, I've I've seen I've seen your work and and how you you've talked to me about your work when you were preparing the book. It is it the work that you've done in the field of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as a competitor, as a coach, and as a writer and a researcher is more than worthy of an honorary doctor degree. You've heard me tell you that several times, and this is from a guy that has a PhD, one hundred percent. If there's somebody in that space, man, I, I would love to be there that day when you get it. Well, thank you, doctor. I, I don't feel that way. I appreciate the kind words, but I don't. I, I think I have. There's a lot of groundwork. There's a lot of work for me to do for me to get to that level. But I, I enjoy it. Like I, I mean, as much work as it is, I, you know, there's a little satisfaction you get from having played a part and improving on jujitsu in some way. Amen. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so much, gentlemen. Fantastic. Man. Yeah, we got, we got, we got to do it again. Of course. We do. We will. We Come can on, maybe like. I, I, can't, I can't believe you've I can't believe seen, I can't believe all three of us, we, we've never met before. All three of us never met. You, you've seen the comments. Everyone says. Dr. Ferguson is your best guest. Uh, I was thinking, like, maybe we can do like a monthly show or something. <laughs> yeah. Bro, do it. Dry, listen, I, when Drysdale and I are on, I love it. I love it. All right. we, 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 I'll we have to come to I owe you that, a visit. I'll have to come visit. I owe you a visit. Yeah, and, and likewise, I owe you one too, man. I owe you one too. We, we can't do shit but talk about our arthritis, but, you know, we're. <laughs> 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 if, we, if we roll, we, we, hey, we got to roll the last day before I leave because otherwise we're gonna be. Sh- <laughs> oh man, well, well it'll, be, it'll be a lot of a lot of stretching, a lot of talking, a lot, a lot of, of stretching. stretching. Bro, if, I, if, if I roll on Monday, I, if I roll on Monday, I'm not rolling again until December. Let me tell you something. I have I have these like wh- whatever like the inflammation is super high in my body. I always feel here in my wrist when I get sick or something. Let me tell you something. Vitamin E, especially those high dose gels, they just help. Like even my psoriasis here, it just goes away. Like everything vitamin that has to, vitamin E. Bro, vitamin E, it gonna, it's not gonna help what I got. I got surgeries and fucking abuse. Oh. All right, I got yes abuse from the coaches, coaches in the training. Listen, as, I, as much as I proselytize for judo and I love judo, everybody, I am telling you that judo on your body is shit. Okay. <laughs> All sports, my friend. Not just just go swimming. Yeah. Go swimming. 
All right, gentlemen, I got to go. All right. All right. Uh, Take care, brother. Take care, man. Thank you so much. Let me turn off the recording. Peace.